Hello, everyone, and welcome to Collider Mailbag. My name is Mark, and this is the show we do on the weekends. It's a little bit more laid back, where we extend the Movie Talk Mailbag into an entire episode. I could not be happier to be joined, not only by the lovely Natisha, Natasha Martinez. Natisha. Natisha <laughs> yeah. Martinez. I love it. <laughs> as well as Dennis Zhang over there in the corner. Yes, WonderCon. We're, after this, we're going to be going to WonderCon. We're going right? to be going back to WonderCon, yeah. and very special announcement, making his debut on Collider Mailbag is the one the only mr mark ellis how about yes. that hey thanks for having me guys back to you mark so anyway <laughs> we're gonna be talking about the mail yes we had a great time at WonderCon yesterday we're going back today and our meet and greet is tonight at the lux hotel we're gonna be there around nine i'll be probably yeah. getting there a little bit late at 9 30 making my fashionably late entrance natasha will probably not be there dennis yes I may be coming. She clicked maybe on the Facebook invite, which means no. <laughs> which is, we were talking yeah. about this. You don't this. know that. At our, at our mailbag meeting, we were talking about what percentage of people who click maybe on Facebook actually show up to the event. And I said over under 10%, Dennis took the under. Yes. I could surprise you guys. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Chase Slyke writes, Hello, Collider crew. Now that many of you have seen Batman v Superman, do you think Zack Snyder should still direct Justice League? Well, you know, we got this question uh, or a similar question on Movie Talk this week, and I think that a lot of people, a lot of critics, if you will, are like, no, don't let him touch that material anymore. He's the wrong director for this. I'm not ready to get on that boat yet, Dennis. Um, there's other visionary directors that I think might be doing a better job uh, with Justice League than what he could be pulling off as of right now after seeing batman v superman look i think it's a little sloppy i think it's a little messy i think a lot of the blame does fall on Zack snyder's shoulders but you got to remember how big of a task it was to not only have that epic battle and the build-up between batman and superman but also introduce elements of the justice league the dawn of justice so it's a lot on somebody's plate i think that once he focuses on the justice league and they're getting together and focusing on one task I think that the way he has such a visual flair and the way that he's able to really treat material with respect as a fan will work for Justice League. I'm not saying he's the best guy to be doing it, but I'm not that apprehensive about it yet. Yeah, it's weird because we did get a question like this. Were we nervous of him handling Justice League? And it's it's weird because both of us had mixed feelings about the movie. Mm -hmm. and But at the same time, for me... I'm not worried about him taking just maybe if Justice League sucks or something it's 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 another like mixed review maybe then I'll be a little nervous but I, I feel like even though I didn't like love Man of Steel like some of our other uh, people here at Collider I did like it enough where I, I never felt nervous about him handling Batman v Superman I I think hopefully he'll be able to focus more on this movie than he was on the last one where that one you had the addition of Ben Affleck as Batman introducing the Batman into that movie which we all agree was some of the best parts of that mm -hmm. um, so I feel like maybe if he gets he, that's out of the way that now he can concentrate on the actual movie and, and, and also he, he shoots entertaining action so that, that's something to look forward to. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, Zack Snyder's a guy that I don't want to tell him how to direct a movie because he's been so successful with it and done a number of really great films over the years. Man of Steel was a movie that I, I liked okay the first time I saw it. And after we did our DVD commentary, I liked it a lot more checking that movie out again. And I love the Guardians of the of Gahul, the Owl movie I thought <laughs> he did, was phenomenal. So he's done great work in the past. After seeing Man of Steel again, I was like, I'm glad this guy is doing Batman versus Superman. While I didn't love that movie, I think it's it's not that I don't want him directing Justice League. It's that maybe I like a slightly different approach where it's more of a collective of ideas, where it's not just one person's vision as to what this should be. But if he's engaging in, you know, meaningful discussions about where to take the film from a directing standpoint with a guy like Ben Affleck who's playing Batman, or Chris Terrio, who's writing this. I think if we get that, and it's more of a, a group of people uniting for one vision, as opposed to just Zack Snyder doing what he feels like doing at the time, I think Justice League could be great. I wonder what would happen if, okay, we have Wonder Woman coming out before Justice League, mm -hmm. and Patty Jenkins is directing. What if that kills at both the box office 
and critically? What if like critics love it and the fans love it? Would you do you think there's going to be kind of a bunch of people kind of like going, oh no, maybe Patty Jenkins should be directing? I think you get you see this with sports sometimes too, where you're not really sure if a coach stepped down or if he was asked to step down <laughs> so they didn't fire somebody. But that could definitely be the case with the second Justice League movie. There's there's been all sorts of rumblings that it that Batman vs Superman has to crush critically and financially in order for Zack Snyder to continue to be the director for Justice League. I don't know that they're just going to throw in another director and say, thanks for playing, Zach. Mm -hmm. I think that with Justice League 2, based on how the first one, or maybe even before the first one comes out, if Zack Snyder, first of all, the guy might just be exhausted. We saw it happen with Joss Whedon, where it's like, dude, I love working on these movies, but I'm just too burnt out. Maybe a little bit of that is studio pressure. And the other part of it is just, it's hard to make movies, and it's hard to receive all this critical backlash, regardless of how big or small it is. It's a lot of pressure to put on one person being the director. So maybe he just doesn't want to do Justice League 2, or maybe they have a conversation like, hey, thanks for everything you've done. We're going to go ahead and give this second one to either Patty Jenkins or if Christopher Nolan wants to step in or whoever, you know, David Fincher wants to come by and do the second one. We're going to give it to somebody else. That might be the case down the road. Jay Poozer Animations writes, Hey, Collider Crew, love the show, and I tune in every video. My question is about the TV superhero shows that most of us watch. After Flash and Arrow recently took a two-week break, Daredevil Season 2 came in to pick up the slack. As we all know, Daredevil Season 2 is way more brutal than shows like Gotham, The Flash, Arrow, Agents of, Se Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., etc. Going back to these shows after seeing Daredevil feels strange. Do you think that more TV shows should be developed like Daredevil on on Netflix, even if they air late at night, or do you think things should stay as they are? Thanks and keep up the awesomeness. Well, I've never been a status quo guy. I always like to shake things up a little bit, which is why I love Daredevil on Netflix. That's one of the many reasons. But I don't know that you necessarily have to tonally go for this ultra, you know, gritty, very brutally violent kind of show every time. I think that Flash and Arrow, those shows appeal to a wide fan base. People really enjoy the way that those narratives have been going. So I'm not so quick to be like, oh, Daredevil's doing it really good. Let's everybody start acting like Daredevil. You don't want a bunch of copycats running around either you want each property to be able to find its own way and where it fits best now maybe there let's say that they were going to put a punisher show on the cw i don't think that's going to fit there but if you look at what the source material is you have so many options whether it's netflix or amazon or hulu or even a network show or something on cable there's ways to find what suits your property the best I like the light tone that The Flash has on the CW in it. I enjoy it. It's a di something different than Netflix. Uh, I will admit, though, like after watching Daredevil season two, and then I, I, I'm not caught up on Arrow, but we do that Arrow recap show mm -hmm. here. I was here and they had it on. And it was strange, like even just following those little clips, I'm like, shouldn't people be like busting heads and like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> lots of murder? Where's and the blood? Exactly. <laughs> so it felt a little weird to see it after that. And I was like, man, this seems. So CW. So, um, yeah, I, but I don't, I agree with you. I don't think you have to have every single show has to be like Daredevil. It, it needs to fit. Punisher fits into to what we saw. Daredevil, like, Flash, I don't know if that, that works, and some other characters as well. That's right. I, I think what Daredevil does, though, is it, it's a signal to the networks that you can't just crank out shows for the sake of having, oh, hey, this is our show. Come watch it. It's got to be good. The production values have to be there regardless of what network you're on. I think one of the things that started that was even before we got Daredevil on Netflix was Game of Thrones on HBO mm -hmm. because, like you said, Dennis, like you can go see something in a movie and then if you see like a great Batman movie, then you go watch Gotham, it's gonna feel a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But I could go watch all the Lord of the Rings movies or something like that and go watch Game of Thrones and be like, this is the same, yeah. it, it all feels the same because it's that quality of a production. As long as you have that in place, then you can land wherever you want. I do like the change in tones though. Mm -hmm. You know, it's even, it goes back to that Marvel DC thing. Like yeah. I like the fact that Marvel has a lighter tone to it. It's a little bit more humor, humorous and then DC can be dark and gritty. I liked it as a fan. Man, I get both those options. You can't like both, Mark. That's, <laughs> have we not pick learned one. from the internet? I you am. cannot like both. You could. You got to pick a side. You can only pick Swinging Marvel both or DC. Ways. No, no. Okay, then you know what? I take Image Comics. That's uh, what I'm taking. I'm a Spawn and Shadowhawk <laughs> guy all the way. 
<laughs> Reed Dudar writes, hello, amazing Collider gang. Love the show and tell all my movie friends to watch all your shows and spin off YouTube channels of other guests. My question is about the spoiler reviews you guys do. I'm wondering, why do you do a spoiler review and have it on the channel for all to watch, usually on the same day the film is released for the mass audience to see? Could you guys maybe record it whenever you would like, of course, but not release the spoiler review to the public for, say, a week or so? Most of the audience won't see the movie the first day it's released, especially now with pre-ticket sales. And let's face it, many people are not skilled at reading on the internet and not as skilled to avoid things like this. Thoughts? I think you need to get better at reading stuff on the internet. Like, <laughs> as a guy who doesn't read a lot of books, this is all you have to do is just really, really make sure. Even before I click on a review that has been released on the internet before the movie comes out, I'm very careful to make sure that it's no spoilers, okay? If I haven't seen the movie. But... I understand where you're coming from. Like, you want to wait until more people have gotten to see the movie. You got to remember, though, if you see, say, Batman v Superman Thursday night at midnight, as soon as it comes out, you get out of that theater, you're talking about it with your friends, you're staying up all night digesting everything you can about what you just saw. That's why we like to do the spoiler reviews, because it's a more extended, more in-depth conversation, and you don't want to have to wait a week to see what personalities that you enjoy talking about movies have to say about this thing that we've all been looking forward to. To. So that's why it's timely. And again, I know reading is very, very hard. You got to look <laughs> at the screen. You got to see the letters. They, 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 they conglomerate into one word. It's very, very tough for me, too. But you got to earn it when it comes to the spoiler reviews. Yeah, we do it for the fans and the viewers who go watch them on Thursday night. And some of them want us to put it because we posted our Batman B spoiler uh, spoiler review on Friday morning, at, I think, 9 a.m. Pacific mm -hmm. time. I know people who probably watched the movie on Thursday that wanted to see the review that night, you know? So we do it for that and do it for another reason. I mean, just to be honest, for YouTube, the search engine opt, uh, algorithms, the, the sooner you put something up, the more chance of, that it goes around. So for us waiting a week, that's, I would guarantee that we would get half the audience if we waited a week later to release our review. And and I, I, you know, I can't sympathize though for the reading aspect, Mark Ellis. I feel like- It's hard. It's very, I, very hard. I feel like it's it's pretty easy to see something that says spoilers on it and go, <laughs> hmm, maybe I shouldn't watch that. And like, I've seen people actually yell and complain about that. It's like, it's not our, like if you don't have the discipline to not watch something that you know you shouldn't be watching, that's on you. That's not on us. Well, we have a two-pronged attack. I'm sure that we, we've done this in Collider, even when I'm not part of the production. Yeah. We do it on Schmoes as well, is that we will say that there's it's spoiler-heavy. Be careful. It's actually a three-pronged attack, much like a fork you'd use to eat food. So we put spoiler review in the title. Then in the description, we say, be very careful. Do not click on this until you've seen the movie. And then also, when we intro the vid, it's like, hey, this <laughs> is the spoiler discussion. So if you guys have not seen the movie, do not click this. Pause it, go see the movie, and come on back. We sympathize with everybody who has not had a chance to see the movie, but this is one of the way that our world works faster than it used to. Same thing with Twitter and Facebook and Instagram is that people, as soon as they see something, they want to have a conversation with other people who have seen it. And who gets lost in that wake is everybody who's like not had a chance to check it out yet. That don't go on Twitter, don't look at stuff that you're not supposed to until you've seen the movie because spoilers are going to be everywhere. We at least warn you. But, and then we also do a non-spoilers review. So sure. you, you can watch that and not get spoiled and then after you've seen the movie, whenever that may be, then you watch the spoilers one. That's right. And fun fact, we film both before you even see the movie. So we yeah. really <laughs> we're just guessing. We're, about. we're, we're guessing. Just shot in the dark. Reading is good, kids. <laughs> All right. Richie K writes, hey, crew, have been a faithful watcher for everything Collider since I found Jedi Council in October. My question is about show openings. What shows do you think have the best opening package? With all the binge watching of Daredevil, the beginning to that show seems very unnerving. It reminds me of Hemlock Grove. What are your thoughts? And keep on being hilarious. Hilarious. I mean, friends, man. I just love that theme song so much. Seeing Chandler and the gang go crazy, that's old school. I would say, you know, the, my favorite TV intro of all time is there's a show, Dennis, I'm sure you watched it. Natasha, I'm not sure it hit your age range, <laughs> called Tales from the Crypt. Uh, nope. It was the best TV intro in history because you would start out going into this house. It was like the it was like the, the diner scene in, or the, the restaurant scene in Goodfellas, where it's just like one camera and it keeps going. You go down a stairway, you see all this creepy stuff. You come to a coffin, then that little guy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he pops up and he scares the crap out of you and then he's dressed in some ridiculous costume and intros the first Tales from the Crypt episode. That was my favorite of all time. Dennis, what are some current ones you like? 
Uh, the Game of Thrones one is awesome. That theme song gets stuck in your head, and they've done like so many variations. If you go on YouTube, mm-hmm. like different violinists will do it, pianists do it. When I go to a hockey game, they'll play it on the organ. Uh, I love that theme song, <laughs> and I love the, the 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 models that they use for it. Um, and the map, it's really nice to see yeah. just how huge and expansive this world. And is. they change it every season based on what areas that they're going to cover do they really yeah, they, yeah. so the wow. first season is different than the second season therefore i mean they have some of the same if they're covering sure. the same one or uh, you know I, it's not a spoiler but like if let's say something happens in that region mm-hmm. they show whatever is changed in that 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 in the beginning i did not pay attention yes to that. so that's one of the best ones today it's it's funny though because sometimes some of my favorite shows or shows that i really like have terrible terrible intros like i love like the wire is my favorite show of all time terrible intro the intro is it looks like it's cut together like when you were in film school you know um just yeah so it does it's not always an indicate joss whedon had uh, a lot of his shows had really cheesy intros where it was just cut together footage from the actual show like that old school like 80s style which i do not like where they just take footage from you know the show. I mean, you saw, um, you've seen uh, Galaxy Quest, right? Mm-hmm. And oh they yeah. Made that that the, the fake show, and they showed the intro where they like they turn and they look and whatever. That's like the '80s for me. That all those intros were like that. Do you? When I was uh, binging on Daredevil last week, it, it felt like I and I love the intro to Daredevil because it really does lock you into the, the the tone of what the show is going for. But after after the first episode, I'm like, ah, let's go. Let's go. That's why I love the show Lost because Lost, you'd have a crazy thing happen at the beginning of the episode and then Lost, and then we're we're right back in. We don't have to wait through an intro. I feel the exact same way. Like I've been binging Friends recently, and I yeah. just I I mean I love that opening, but I just skip right through it. I'm like just just get to it. <laughs> it's such a great song. It though. is, it is. But after a while, the song it's too much. <laughs> okay, Ruslan Mamadov writes: Hello, Collider. Could poor Batman be Superman? Rotten Tomato score affect Suicide Squad's box office is Zack Snyder the right guy to be trusted with a multi-billion franchise thanks and much love I think you're on the right path there but I think less Rotten Tomatoes score and more box office and fan reception is what you would look for as an indicator as to how Suicide Squad is going to be doing but even with those factors in play Dennis I think that Suicide Squad is going to be marketed not because they're trying to get away from Batman versus Superman but because they want to establish themselves as their own movie that yes takes place in the same universe but these are villains that we're going to meet they're going on a different quest Batman's going to be popping in there we've seen that but I I think that because the movies tonally are going to be so different than what we saw and the grand scope is not going to be as big, at least in my opinion, from what I've seen from those trailers so far as what we're dealing with in something like Batman versus Superman. So I don't think that this Rotten Tomatoes score, the critical reception of B versus S is going to have a lot to do with how Suicide Squad does box office wise. I agree. I don't think it's going to affect it very much because, like you said, it's totally different. So you're kind of getting more of a guardians of the galaxy but maybe a little darker vibe Mm -hmm. from suicide squad and then you have you know a cameo of batman uh in the movie but even the critics love Batman in Batman v Superman. If there's a Rotten Tomato score just for Batman, yes. it'd be like much 95%. Higher. Yeah. Much higher. So I don't think it will affect it. And Suicide Squad is not looking for the numbers that a Batman v Superman. They spent way more money on Batman v Superman, both in production and marketing costs. Suicide Squad, they spent less. They're, they're going to market it, but they're not going to, it's not going to be this heavy blitz that, that like, I, I we live here in, in Los Angeles and the Warner Brothers studio, I drive past past it every day to come here and they usually they have the posters right they have it for all the warner brothers like either tv shows or movies each one there's probably like eight or nine of them has one for a different show or movie these are all batman v superman yeah. all batman v superman the tower the, the WB Water Tower has Batman v Superman. They're not doing that for Suicide Squad. It is going to be really interesting to see as we get closer in, you know, when it's a few weeks away or it's opening that week and how much of Suicide Squad you see and how they're going to choose who's going to be the lead horse that they used to sell that movie. Is it going to be Joker, the yeah. way that Jared Leto looks? Is it going to be Will Smith, who's a huge, not as big as he was, but yeah. still a very huge box office star? Margot Robbie is very popular right now. So it's going to be interesting to see if they choose to focus on a few of them or they're more going after the team aspect of what they're trying to accomplish. I think Joker and Harley Quinn are going to be the main focus of the marketing, just because Joker, obviously, everyone loves the Joker as a villain, and Harley Quinn is 
turned into quite a popular character. And I think the marriage of of Margot Robbie and that character, I think that's a match made in heaven. And then Batman comes in, I thought she was with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jared Klein writes, hey guys, been watching since nearly the beginning of the AMC days. My question, would you consider doing movie commentaries for both Captain America movies before the release of Civil War? I'd love to hear your opinions on those films. God bless and keep on rocking. We will keep on rocking and we'll probably keep on rocking with, I would, I would guess it's a, it's a good shot that we're going to going to do a commentary based on some sort of Marvel film before Civil War. Now, what that's going to be, Dennis, is mainly up to you. Yes. Um, I love the first Captain America mm -hmm. movie. The first Avenger I thought was so well done. Winter Soldier, I'm a huge fan of, just not as much as some other people here at Collider. I think that that's one of those reviews that I got killed for mm -hmm. when I said it was really, really good as opposed to the greatest film in Marvel history. Well, everything has to be the greatest that's right. Mark, I mean, yeah, every it, movie it, that you see has to be the greatest. It's got to be the greatest or it's got to be so bad. I think that I would personally like to revisit the Winter Soldier again mm -hmm. um, just because maybe it'll do what Man of Steel did when we did that commentary because mm -hmm. I really appreciate it a different way. Sitting around with three other people who are getting so sweaty over how great this movie is. Maybe it'll bring my opinion of that movie up a hair. Uh, I think we probably will at least try to do the Winter Soldier one. I know there's plans to do the Force Awakens first because the Blu-ray is coming out pretty soon. Um, but in terms of Captain, yeah, he's getting a little greedy there. Want us to do both, both of them? <laughs> I think we we're gonna have to time reasons and resource reasons. We're gonna skip over the first Captain America movie. I mean, that was so long ago, and I, I feel like the Winter Soldier has more bearing on on this film oh absolutely yeah. i mean it was done by the russo brothers it, the political overtones more lead right into what we're going to be dealing with with civil war something else you said that really struck me force awakens comes out on blu-ray yeah. i'm going to get to see it again really soon i five times just wasn't enough in the theater i cannot <laughs> wait to see it again <laughs> Emily Rosas writes, Hey, Collider crew, love the show. I most I know most of y'all go to press screenings, so I was curious as to how those work. Do they offer you food or can you bring your own in? Is it at the theater that the studio rents out or at a studio lot? Do y'all have to sign, sign in and sign out? Do you have to give your critic score of the movie there or do you send it into Rotten Tomatoes, etc.? Thanks and keep up the great work. Mm, Dennis, I don't know if I told you, but one time <laughs> I went to a dreary screening with no caveat. <laughs> Pain whatsoever. <laughs> um, occasionally, they will give you free food. They'll give you like a little thing that says, uh, "Here's like one small popcorn." They never give you the large. No. They never give you the large. <laughs> I've gone so far as to take that cute little ticket they give you to redeem a free, you know, small popcorn, and I just give it to a child walking by, and I say, "There you go," because I'm going to see a huge blockbuster, and Mark needs his large <laughs> corn. Um, but yeah, that that happens on rarer occasions. If the screening is at a movie theater, which I'd say it's about half and half, sometimes. Sometimes they're at the studios. Sometimes it's at a movie theater. There, I will get food virtually every time. I love eating popcorn when I see a movie and drinking soda. Uh, at the studio, Dennis, depending on which one it is, which lot you're on, sometimes they have popcorn machines that are working. Sometimes they just rub it in your face because you walk into the lobby and you see that they have popcorn machines that look functioning, but yes. they're barren. Nothing is sadder on this earth than seeing a barren, empty popcorn machine with people going in to see a movie. Well, I was never a Boy Scout, but I always try to be prepared. So I always <laughs> sneak in food, whether or not they have it or not. I always have like some snacks in my jacket or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's sometimes it's on the lot. Sometimes it's at the theater. Um, they don't ask you to give your score, though, right after. That's a that's a little too much pressure. It's like you watch the movie. They, they ask you your opinion, right? They want to know like your general thoughts, but they don't sit there and go, Mark Ellis, one out of ten. What do you rank the movie yeah. you just saw? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. Won't be coming to see our next movie. <laughs> see, I'm such an antisocial weirdo that after the movie, like like Christian and I see virtually every movie together, whether it's at the lot or on, uh, at a theater. And walking out, he will not stop talking to people. He, he will accost <laughs> strangers to talk about the movie he just saw. I do not want to talk to anybody. I'm usually wearing a hoodie. I put my hood up and I walk out because I don't want to, I, I just want to kind of digest the movie on my own a little bit and get in the car and drive home and think about it. But uh, I... 
I never, occasionally you'll have somebody from the studio and they'll ask you like, what was your take on the movie? Sometimes you get an email the next day like, hey, would love to hear your thoughts. The first time I ever got one of those emails, I was thinking so hard, it's like, what do I write? Because I'm thinking, oh, they want my take on the poster. You know, like I was gonna be like, like you know, like Roger Ebert says this, it's gonna be Mark Ellis says this. I've never made a poster, I don't really try anymore. I don't really want to be on the poster. Christian made the, uh, he was on, his, his quote, I think for Creed was on, was on TV. That's awesome. Yeah, like oh, you said, man. oh, it rocks. New York pizza's the best, or whatever he wrote <laughs> on that. It made it to TV, so that was pretty cool. Cool. All right, our last mailbag of the day. Andrew Keen writes, Hi, Collider Video. I really enjoy watching all of your content, particularly some of the behind-the-scenes mailbags. I was wondering if you have ever slash would ever consider doing a video or series about some of the different aspects of making a film. You often talk about this person being a good screenwriter or really enjoying that person's cinematography, but rarely go into details about what it takes to be successful at any particular area. I think that with the talent you have both on and off camera and with some of your contacts in the industry, you could make some insightful, in-depth, and fun videos on these kinds of things. Thanks and keep up the fantastic work that you do. Insightful, in-depth, and fun. I'm kind of good at one of those things. <laughs> um, it sounds actually like a really cool video series that I would probably be better at watching than I would be actually producing or starring in because there's so many elements of the film world that I am not not familiar with and don't really care to ever explore most of those are behind the camera I mean I've acted in films before I have a movie coming out fairly soon that I'll promote to you guys when it's closer to the release date but as far as like directing a movie or even writing a movie writing was just never something that struck me a lot of comics love writing too I like writing jokes for myself that's about it never really took a stab at a screenplay never really wanted to directing producing all that stuff sounds like such a headache I never want to get involved in any of that but I would be very intrigued by learning more about the process and I know we have a lot of talent that's very skilled at all of those things that go into making a movie like yourself like Schnepp mm -hmm. Uh, would you guys ever consider doing that? Uh, probably video or videos. I don't know about a series, though, because a series means that you have to constantly do it. And I don't know if we have the time for it. And it definitely, I, I, I know some people would be interested in seeing that, but it's definitely not going to be something big where, like, tons of people are watching it. So something, yeah, where maybe if, you know, we, we end up shooting something, I don't know, maybe something for Collider Video, and then we shoot some behind the scenes stuff for it and say, okay, this is how we did this, and this is, you know, how this process works. But, but it, it, you know, the, it, it all depends. Let, let, let's see what happens on, in the future. It really is flattering how much people like to know more about what goes on here at mm -hmm. the Collider Studio. <laughs> like, they just, they, they don't want to accept that this is a hollowed out volcano <laughs> in Cincinnati, Ohio. They just, they're, they're convinced that we're somewhere in Southern California, somewhere and we're not. Cool. Or are we? <laughs> All right, I think that's it for today. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for welcoming me with open arms to my very first Collider mailbag. First of all, Dennis Zeng over there in the corner, where can people find you online and where can they find you this evening? Well, you can find me online on Twitter at Think Hero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG, and you can find myself and Mark Ellis and maybe Natasha <laughs> uh, tonight at uh, the Lux Hotel, second floor lobby, 9 p.m., we might, you know, we're going to pack up all our stuff after the Heroes panel and rush over there. So we might be a little bit late. And Natasha Martinez, where can the kids find you? And what movie will you be seeing this weekend? So I'm seeing My Big Fat Greek Wedding 2 this weekend. Woo! Um, you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore and maybe find me at the Lux Hotel. Tonight. It's a <laughs> definite maybe if Facebook is any indication. Uh, my name is Mark. Thank you guys for tuning in. You can find me on all the social media channels at Mark Ellis Live. That's also the website where you can go to get tickets for my upcoming stand-up comedy tour. Let's see. We're going to New Orleans. We're going to Columbus, Ohio, Detroit are some of the next stops and then Minneapolis and Boston I'll see you guys down the road thanks for having me guys maybe I make it back tomorrow we'll have to wait to find out see you guys then hopefully hey guys if you like this video click the thumbs up button also make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel it'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider